Would you want to pay for your groceries or coffee with your face? That seems pretty convenient. But is it secure? More on this in a moment. Also on the show, families of victims of a US school shooting are suing a gaming company and a social media platform. And heat waves are scorching the globe. Tech might help us tackle the problem. We'll show you the latest developments. These are the topics that are moving the tech world. Have you ever paid in a shop simply by showing your face? Chances are that you will soon. Biometric payments are on the rise. Researchers forecast over 3 trillion US dollars worth of biometric payments next year. And lots of those payments will come from face scans in a shop or restaurant. But is it safe? What happens to the data? And could I charge my sister's credit card instead of mine? If you haven't done it yourself, you've most likely seen someone unlock their phone with their face. Apple, for example, already offers the so-called Face ID. It works just like a fingerprint scanner on a phone, except that your face is your biometric identification point. Chinese financial service provider Alipay has pushed this to the next level. Payment by showing your face only. You don't need to present a bank card or show your phone. Now, big financial players like JP Morgan and MasterCard are pushing pay by face as well as online giants like Amazon. It's expected that within the next years, more and more pay by face systems will be established. How does it work? Well, it's very simple. First, you capture your biometrics by activating your camera or even with a simple selfie. The face is then broken down into data points, which are stored in so-called tokens. So there is no photo of you stored on a server somewhere. The tokens are enough to identify your face. Then you need to connect your face data to your bank account or credit card. If you are in a store or restaurant that supports pay by face, you simply press a button on the payment terminal. The device scans your face and voila, you just paid with your face. Meaning you granted the restaurant permission to debit the payment from your bank account. Is it secure? Biometric authentication is a much safer technology than passwords or pins. A face scan is also more secure than other biometrics, like a fingerprint. According to manufacturers, a face can't be hacked like a password. The systems also have extra security layers and therefore can't be easily tricked by a photo of a person or even by a mask. The technology isn't perfect though. It's not recommended for children under 13 because their facial features may not be fully developed. And how about people that look just like their siblings, say twins? Would a twin be able to use their own face to make payments in their sibling's name without their knowledge? Well, pay by face companies at least can't rule that out. If you have a twin and are concerned about them using your account without your authorization, you should immediately set a custom pin after you create your Pop ID account. That's what face payment service Pop ID says. But what is the catch? As often, your convenience comes with the exposure of your data. Biometric tokens make it much harder for criminals to hack your accounts. But security activists are warning that biometrics theft is becoming more commonplace. And there is even more to consider. Some political regimes try to track and identify people using facial recognition systems. In order to identify, say, protesters, they need a database to compare the data to. So they could be very interested in your pay by face data. And even though tech companies assure us that all our data is encrypted and stored securely, we have seen companies hand out data to governments before. So definitely make sure that you trust any company you use this technology with. Two big names in tech are being sued over their alleged role in a US school shooting. One is Activision, the company that makes the first person shooter game Call of Duty, where you as the player use a weapon yourself in the game. This ego perspective is what gives the genre its name, ego shooter. The other firm is Meta, parent company of Instagram and Facebook. Families of victims are accusing the tech firms of collaborating with the firearms industry and claim they bear some responsibility for the shooting. Here's what you need to know. In May 2022, 18-year-old Salvador Ramos, a former student of Robb Elementary School, fatally shot 19 students and two teachers. 17 others were injured but survived. Ramos was shot on site by police officers. This tragic incident reignited heated discussions about American gun culture and violence. Now, families of the victims claim that gaming company Activision and social media company Meta 
bear some responsibility. In a separate lawsuit, they are also suing firearm manufacturer Daniel Defense, which made the rifle used in the shooting. The indictment reads, over the last 15 years, two of America's largest technology companies have collaborated with the firearms industry. That's a serious accusation. Is Meta promoting guns? And do ego shooters turn gamers into killers? Well, the scientific verdict on the last matter is rather clear. There is no causal link between playing video games and gun violence in real life. That's according to a majority of scientists. And a recent review of 82 medical research articles on the topic drew the same conclusion. But the plaintiffs are not targeting this link between gaming and violence. They are targeting a special feature of Call of Duty where the weapons in the game mimic real life weapons. Basically, they are claiming the game teaches players how to handle firearms. The indictment states that even though killing is part of many games, the look and feel of the guns in Call of Duty is extremely realistic. That gets people, especially young ones, interested in buying real weapons. The fictional weapon in the game Call of Duty called M4A1 is strongly based on existing AR-15 models. The shooter Salvador Ramos used such a weapon in Uvalde. And AR-15s have also been involved in 10 of the US's 17 deadliest mass shootings since 2012. In early titles of the Call of Duty franchise, Activision actually had licensing deals with gun manufacturers or used real gun names. After legal problems, they decided to work with lookalikes. For the plaintiffs, that is simply not good enough. They've made some serious allegations. The defendants bear responsibility for this profound corruption of our children. In concert with certain firearm manufacturers, they have groomed a generation of young men who are socially vulnerable, insecure about their masculinity, and eager to show strength and assert dominance. Defendants have spent years positioning their counterparts in the gun industry as the answer to those problems. To sum it up, the trial is not about the question of whether first-person shooter games incite violence, but about whether Call of Duty is promoting guns and teaching people how to handle them. Selling guns via social media? The accusations against Meta are similar. Meta's social media app Instagram offers firearm manufacturers something even Call of Duty cannot, an unsupervised channel to speak directly to minors in their homes, at school, even in the middle of the night. According to the lawsuit, the Uvalde shooter was targeted on Instagram by a Daniel Defense ad, a weapons manufacturer that produces AR-15 rifles. Daniel Defense is also being sued by the plaintiffs because officially gun sales are forbidden on Meta's platforms. In reality, the company discloses little information about how it enforces this. An investigation by the Washington Post even revealed that gun buyers and sellers on Facebook could violate the rule 10 times before they got kicked off. Apart from that, Meta's insufficient regulation of its ad ecosystem has been heavily criticized for years. It's hard to predict how all of this will play out in court. But what do you think? Are these valid arguments? Let us know your opinion. Sweating buckets these days? You're not alone. Heat waves are scorching the globe. This year, there's already been record-breaking temperatures in India, Mexico, and more, and regions like South America and Southeast Asia have been hit with heat waves too. It's a huge burden for people and nature when temperatures regularly exceed 40 degrees Celsius. The number of people exposed to extreme heat is growing rapidly. Nearly half a million lives are lost to it each year. The situation is grim and we need solutions to the climate crisis fast. But how can we deal with this heat? Here are four tech solutions that might help. First, thermoregulatory clothing. Bit of a mouthful to say. British scientists have developed a fabric using graphene that cools you down in hot weather and warms you up when it's cold. So how does it work? Well, our bodies radiate heat in the form of electromagnetic waves. Graphene can help regulate body temperature, either keeping the heat in or releasing it. Whether it warms or cools can be changed by applying electricity to the fabric. Doesn't sound like the most practical solution when you're out and about and the weather changes. Another group of researchers propose flaps that respond to temperature, staying closed when it's cold and bending to release excess heat when it's hot. The good thing about this solution, you don't need external electricity to tell the fabric to keep the heat in or release it. The second solution, cooling paint. American researchers developed a paint that reflects 98% of sunlight, cooling surfaces up to 10 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature. Meanwhile, an Israeli startup is working on a multi-layered coating that cools when hit by sunlight. The sunlight is absorbed by the upper layers and re-emitted with less energy. 
The remaining energy causes heat to emit from the lower layer, which cools it down. It could be used to coat walls, but also other things like cars. Thirdly, sunglasses for windows. In China, researchers created a transparent film that changes color and blocks sunlight. Unlike traditionally tinted windows, this film can switch back to being transparent, letting the light in when it's needed. And finally, heat maps. They essentially show you where it's hot and where you might find a cooler place. This works by sensors around the city mapping the heat. Citizens could view such maps via smartphone apps and plan their routes accordingly. Additionally, heat maps could provide further information, like where to find the next cooling center. A cooling center is an air-conditioned, quiet room where people can recover from heat stress for a few hours. In addition to the cool air, there's a supply of drinking water, as there's a particularly high risk of dehydration when it's hot. Sounds pretty nice, but why can't we all just use air conditioning? It's been our go-to solution for combating heat, but air conditioning is simply not sustainable. AC units are energy hogs, leading to higher electricity consumption and more greenhouse gas emissions, which accelerate global warming. And that brings us to the real problem. Battling heat waves is only battling the symptoms. As long as we're not doing everything we can to slow down climate change, they will only get worse. So how can we use AC sustainably? Well, first, the energy used to power air conditioners needs to be sustainable. Wind, solar, water, you name it. Smart grids could then optimize energy distribution, reducing losses and allowing more devices to be powered. This works by using AI and lots of data gathered from sensors around cities. Let's say, for example, that temperatures are rising in a certain area. The smart system would then distribute more power to that zone because it expects people to turn on their AC units. Sounds good, but when will we actually get there? Well, even though these technologies have potential, widespread adoption is still a long way off. Firstly, they're pricey. Not every city can afford to build a smart grid or houses with cooling paint. Or some can, but don't want to invest the money. Secondly, old infrastructure needs to be updated, which takes time, resources, and a big workforce. And lastly, regulatory hurdles can delay the implementation of the tech. What's your take on this? Can technology really help tackle climate change? Or is it just a drop in the ocean? Let us know. That's it from me. See you next time.